and you will see that in the left uh, top hand corner if you are watching on desktop uh, of your window you will see a uh, two icons one will say recording the other one will say live on youtube uh, and you might also see a pop up which says is it okay to continue with this meeting since it is being recorded okay all right good now that i have explained all of these basic issues uh, do any of you have any any um, procedural questions okay so if there are any you should please ask me at any point in time and uh, so today's class is going to be like till 9 am if any of you have to leave early you please let me know uh, so let's see okay so as i uh, told you in in yesterday uh <clears throat> over the past two months i have covered a certain amount of material uh, but of course i don't expect uh, you know uh, to be able to cover all that material again with you now as msc students i have a little bit of expectation that uh, much of this material is not new to you uh, that you should be familiar with it right so the concepts of uh, vector spaces and uh, linear algebra and uh, uh, what do you call it uh, what else is there uh, quantum mechanics you, you should have had a quantum mechanics class in your in your bsc uh, the difference is that when we first have our introductory quantum mechanics whether introductory one or introductory two uh, the uh, way it is normally taught in uh, your introductory courses is uh, in the following in the following manner and right? let me uh, so you can see my you can see my um, tablet screen and i'm going to write on this this is my blackboard okay so i share these notes uh, with you uh, at the after after every class uh sometimes i forget to share them out right away after the class uh if if you uh, but then my expectation is also that you are not just sitting there uh, playing pubg uh, on your phone while the class is going on of course uh, unfortunately for all of us uh, pubg is no longer available uh, but there are other alternatives such as call of duty and lots of you know play store is full of them uh, so uh yes uh, rakshit i'm sure that you have found a work around so two thumbs up so uh this class number uh, i believe it's class number 25 and today is october 7th and also uh, to all those uh, of the btech students who uh, are might be attending today uh, welcome uh, so today as i told you today and tomorrow will be review classes okay so in the normal uh, quantum mechanics curriculum the way that uh, the material is normally is covered is that you are told about you know you are you are given some some historical background uh about quantum mechanics and usually this includes uh okay screen needs to be clean from time to time otherwise you get some historical background uh about the you know origins of quantum mechanics and that historical background can can go into various amounts of detail uh you know start start talking about black body radiation uh uh and uh, the photoelectric effect and all of these other other phenomena uh which uh, uh were the initial phenomena which required uh
so i'm i'm calling it the de bro bro a uh, brogai effect so actually the pronunciation of of uh, this guy's name he's a he was a french uh, and he was actually his royalty he was french prince or something he was an aristocrat so his his name is uh, obviously not pronounced de brogli that's how um ignorant people like me who don't know french uh, will say it. Uh, the correct pronunciation, and we should we should all pronounce um, people's names correctly, right? Uh, is uh, if I uh, deep row guy, so I'm going to use I'm going to say deep row guy, and that might also be the wrong pronunciation. Uh, so if anybody is watching this and uh, uh, notices that, uh, then uh, I hope they will not be too offended. So the deep row guy effect, and then there is another one which is the Compton effect. And then there is the Stern Gerlach experiment, right? But by the time we get to the Stern Gerlach experiment, quantum mechanics had already been born. And oh, I also forgot very important uh, the uh, the spectral lines of uh, among other among other. Uh, substances the spectral lines of hydrogen right so all of these were the phenomena uh, which presaged uh, the birth of quantum mechanics and then we have uh, the initial steps right so the initial steps so the thing is that i'm not going to go into a, this in more detail my assumption is that again as msc students you uh, have an inherent interest in learning the history of physics and uh, the internet is full of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of references uh, so if you don't already know the history of quantum mechanics that is something that you know you absolutely should go and uh, and 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 read up about okay Okay. Now, okay. So, Okay, uh, so the uh, initial steps that were taken uh, mathematically, uh, you know, and in terms of the theoretical development, were uh, Planck's quantum hypothesis, right? And he used this to explain uh, uh, the. Uh, the Rayleigh genes he used to ex explain why, uh, in the question of uh, black body radiation, for example, uh, or actually rather than black body radiation, that is a very actually uh, that is an incorrect and that is a wrong expression uh, because there should actually be thermal body radiation because uh, uh, so we are talking about objects which are hot. And objects which are hot, uh, they are not black in any sense. They are actually the opposite of black. In any, if anything, it should be called white body radiation. But again, instead of talking about white or black, because those are also incorrect, because as you know, that what actually happens is that you get a, you get a spectrum of radiation at various wavelengths. Uh, and uh, so it's actually a whole rainbow kind of you know it's, it's a spectrum and so it's better to refer to it as thermal body radiation so that is what i will just call it from now on so you have planck's quantum hypothesis then you have einstein who uses that hypothesis right and applies it for example to the photoelectric effect uh, then a few years later you have bohr who uses uh, this notion uh, to explain uh, 
the quantization of uh, hydrogen orbit. So this explains. Uh, uh, so Planck's quantum hypothesis explains the thermal body radiation problem. This explains the photoelectric effect. Einstein's work. Uh, Bohr uh, uses it to describe the quantization of hydrogen orbits, which explains uh, the the structure of the spectrum of hydrogen and uh, also the the spectrum of solar solar lines. So people would uh, measure the spectrum of light coming from the sun, for example. And uh, since the sun is made up mostly of hydrogen and helium, uh, naturally the uh, spectrum would be dominated by the uh, hydrogen lines. And uh, it was actually in the spectrum, they saw lines, discrete lines rather than a continuous spectrum. And the question was, why were there discrete lines? And the answer goes back to the fact that they're discrete lines because uh, the states of uh, the hydrogen atom are quantized in discrete steps. And that is something that you cannot explain using classical theory. So then after Bohr, uh, then there was also, Sommerfeld, who you know complemented Bohr's work, so I should also mention Sommerfeld. Uh, then there was a bit of a gap uh, until uh, uh, De Broglie came along with his uh, wave wave hypothesis, and so this was the beginning of the real birth of quantum mechanics, right? Because this was when uh, wave particle duality and uh, the uh, so. Uh, was discovered and the first application of this was for example to to particle diffraction neutron diffraction so neutrons are particles and diffraction is a wave phenomena uh, so because of the uh, de broglie effect uh, neutrons also behave like waves right according to the uh, de broglie hypothesis lambda is equal to x by p and so they undergo uh, diffraction when you send neutrons towards uh, or electrons or any other particles towards some kind of a double slit or single slit. And the results of from that diffraction, you can measure the wavelength of the incoming uh, radiation and the wavelength agrees with uh, the value given by this expression. Then after de Broglie, the next uh, major step was taken by Schrodinger. Uh, who gave his famous equation that we all know by his name, the Schrodinger equation, right? Uh, and this was the first uh, mathematical formulation of quantum mechanics, right? And this was when quantum mechanics actually came out into the world kicking and screaming. Uh, all of this was uh, the early birth. This was the conception. Uh, this was when quantum mechanics was still a baby growing inside the tummy, uh, this is when quantum mechanics uh, started to decide to come out into the real world and with Schrodinger, the quantum mechanics came out as an actual, uh, well, <laughs> as far as one can take this analogy of a baby, it came out as a, as a baby into the world. So the Schrodinger equation, uh, was introduced and this was around uh, 1926, I think, 1926-27. Then things happened very fast. And in the following years, uh, other people, Heisenberg, uh, Jordan, there were a lot of people whose names uh, uh, we often uh, don't hear so much, uh, but, but who were very uh, significant in the early history of quantum mechanics. Without them, quantum mechanics would not have existed. Um, Heisenberg, Jordan, uh, Pasquale, and lots of lots of other people. And the, the, so these guys came up with uh, matrix mechanics. And then 
later on very quickly somebody showed i think it was didac who showed that uh, matrix mechanics and wave mechanics so what schrodinger gave was a wave equation and what heisenberg gave was a matrix equation so matrix equation means that linear it's linear algebra so you have to remember that back in those days in 1927 28 uh we we are used to the concept of matrices because they are taught to us from the age of from uh, you know our early sometime after middle school i think uh 7th grade onwards but uh in those days uh, the linear algebra was still an uh, subject of research the concept of matrices was uh something that most people didn't really know about what so what we take for granted these days basis vectors like in values and so on uh in those days you would have to be a mathematician uh, to know uh what what these things were so so people didn't realize that well this matrix mechanics and this wave equation they are actually the same thing and then dirac i think i might be wrong about this but because dirac who showed that well uh matrices is equal to roughly very roughly speaking that matrices is equal to wave then uh, from then on my quantum mechanics developed very rapidly and uh, well there is a very long and beautiful history of how it turned into quantum field theory and then it turned you know high energy particle physics uh and then it was applied to everything in condensed matter physics many body physics so condensed matter many body and now quantum mechanics is applied in like practically every area of physics uh in fact we are finding out that it quantum mechanics even uh, applies to biology that uh, within biological systems you have quantum quantum phenomena at the scale of uh, living living organism living cells um then of course quantum chemistry is one of the oldest parts developed by pauling and many others and so on so without quantum mechanics course so you can say that quantum mechanics forms the foundation of our modern world essentially okay without quantum mechanics you don't have the band structure of solids you don't have uh, uh you don't you don't have uh, semiconductors uh i mean you have semiconductors you don't have a theory to explain semiconductivity and superconductors and so on okay so 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 these are all uh, the initial steps okay so i'm not going to go into any more detail than this again my presumption is that uh, you will study these ish topics on your own or have studied these topics on your own but i just want to emphasize that uh, the history of any subject uh, is very very important so it doesn't matter what that subject is that if you are studying martial arts let's say okay as an example when you are studying say something like taekwondo now uh you could just go into uh, the uh, classroom and learn the basic moves of taekwondo or even the very advanced moves and you could become an accomplished uh, you know whatever six dan or seven dan or black belt but uh, if you don't know what the history of taekwondo is then uh, that will you will just be at some level you will just be a a technical you will have a technical mastery right you will you will master the the technique but you will not understand the philosophy you will not understand the motivation behind it so you won't know why the techniques are of the form that they are is the same thing in in anything else the physics chemistry math history geography whatever medicine if you don't know the history of how things developed then at best you will be a technical expert but you will never really have a true understanding of the subject so study the history study the philosophy if you want to be a good physicist uh, that is what you have to do so now uh, we come to the mathematical uh, part 
So what, what is the mathematical foundation of quantum mechanics? So in any undergraduate course, and well, in several graduate courses also, people would spend about half the semester just explaining all of these developments that I've talked about very quickly here. Uh, but uh, since it's a graduate level course, uh, we don't have that uh, luxury. And we want to get down to understanding quantum mechanics in uh, the nitty gritty of quantum mechanics. I'll stop here. Uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask or uh, you can also uh, let me go and look in the YouTube chat room. Maybe there are any questions. There are no questions. Okay. And if you look in the YouTube, uh, if, in case that is open, if that window is open, you will see that uh, one person, he is one of my BTEC students, Akash Wilfred. Uh, he has joined via YouTube. So, uh, are there any questions in the Telegram? No. Okay. All right. Well, it's difficult to do all these things and still uh, teach a different thing. Okay. All right. Okay. So, what is the mathematical foundation of quantum mechanics? The mathematical foundation of quantum mechanics is the following. It says that any system is described by a state. And this state is a vector. In a vector space, which is called a, it is a certain kind of vector space. And that vector space is called a Hilbert space that's named after uh, David Hilbert, who was one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century. So this is, this, this, this is essentially the math, that's it. <laughs> this is the mathematical foundation of quantum mechanics. And this is basically what we are going to spend much of this semester understanding. Because all of the consequences follow from this simple statement that quantum mechanical system, that systems are described by vectors in some Hilbert space. And from this point on, you can actually forget about, uh, well, not forget about physics, but uh, you, if, you, if you just follow this single thread and you keep asking, well, okay, a state is a vector, great. That means that all states are vectors, great, okay. So then how do I describe uh, how vectors are affected, what operations can happen on vectors, right? So any operations that can happen on vectors or any change that happens on a vector will be described by operators. And these operators will be matrices, right? Which act on that the chat on that uh, vector space, right? But then the thing is that physics, the physics input is very important, right? So the physics input uh, tells us that uh, there are certain kinds of operators which are more important than others. And so these, these operators, these, uh, the, they are important uh, and they are known as, one kind is known as Hermitian operators, another kind is known as unitary operators. And basically they correspond to, so a vector, uh, so I can write a vector as in the normal notation as something like V, uh, but we will be working with uh, complex vector spaces. And so in complex vector spaces, we actually have a vector and it's complex conjugate, right? Because you can have complex conjugation. And so these, these two things are uh, denoted in the, in something called as Dirac notation, Dirac notation, which is, you know, because Dirac came up with it with, uh, it is written like this with angular brackets. And the first guy is called Ket. And the second guy is called Bra. 
right? Because together it forms a bracket. And so Dirac uh, and the other people who first came up with these with these names, uh, they were not very <laughs> socially sophisticated people at that time. Uh, so they did not realize the consequences of calling uh, these uh, objects by these names, but those names have stuck. And so that is what we continue to use. And uh, that is what we use. So then operators correspond to matrices on that Hilbert space. So, uh, and how does a matrix act on a vector? Well, uh, you take uh, some matrix multiplied by a vector and you get another vector, right? And this is also an element of the same vector space. So then what is a Hermitian operator? Hermitian operator is a Hermitian matrix. That means, so with matrices, you can have certain operations. You can have, for example, you can take the transpose of a matrix. You can take the inverse of a matrix. Uh, you can, uh, if you have a complex matrix, you can take it complex conjugate. And you can also take the transpose and then the complex conjugate. And this operation is, is given its own name. Uh, so it's called uh, the adjoint. So this is very important. This is called the Hermitian adjoint. So Hermitian matrices are those which satisfy this relationship that uh, if you take the complex transpose of the matrix, it is equal to the original matrix. So in terms of elements, I would write it like this. So for example, the matrix elements would be written as AIJ. So then if I ask what is A transpose, the matrix elements would be written as AJI. And the complex conjugate of the transpose would be AJI. Uh, star like this. So if I want to write down uh, what is A transpose, uh, again, so I should write this with, with brackets. Okay. So uh, this statement is that Aij is equal to Aji complex conjugate. Right? So if a matrix is equal to its own transpose, we call it a symmetric matrix. If it is equal to the negative of its, uh, so this is symmetric and anti-symmetric matrices. So Aij is equal to Aji, Aij is equal to minus Aji. So, when you're working with complex objects, you have the additional option of Hermitian, uh, which comes from the concept of complex conjugation combined with transposition. And you can also have matrices which are equal to the negative of their own complex conjugate. Those are known as anti-Hermitian matrices. anti-Hermitian and maybe my writing is a little bit small. Try to make it bigger from now on. Then unitary matrices, they satisfy the condition that A complex conjugate transpose or A adjoint is equal to the inverse of that matrix. Okay. Uh, so when for, for purely real matrices, uh, that means if so, if A is a real matrix, then I would write it like this. A is an element of R D to uh, send a cross product with R D. What is R D? Well, R is the real line, right? It's the set of all real numbers. C is the complex plane, the set of all complex numbers. Right, and like this, you have other other notation. For example, you have n, which is the natural numbers. Natural numbers are what? Anybody? Any volunteers? Natural numbers are 
natural numbers are all the numbers uh, integers which are positive so one onwards and then you have q which is a set of rational numbers that's it can't know answer you have the set of rational numbers and then you have uh, z which is a set of all integers so these are some notation that you should be familiar with so r is the set of all real numbers and so if you write something like r to the d what does that mean that means you have you have d you have d copy you have d real numbers right so if you have a vector which is a d dimensional vector uh which has components which has d components so i would write them as v1 v2 till v of d this is an element of r d right so because well that is the set right then what is a matrix so a matrix is a d dimensional or i should say it's a d by d dimensional matrix right and these are square matrices of course you don't have need to have square matrices you can have a rectangular matrices also so these matrices a11 a12 and so on till a d d right and so this is an element of r d cross r d right one set of r's for the columns and one set of r's for the rows for example okay now uh, of course you can have a p times q dimensional matrix p and q don't need to be the same this will be an element of r p or like this okay you should know this this notation is you familiar with it all right so now when i take a matrix and multiply it when i take a d by d matrix and multiply it by a d dimensional vector i get another another d dimensional vector right okay so now uh so this is the this is the foundation of this is the basic statement of lean, lean, the ingredients of linear algebra uh, you have states which are described by vectors you have operators on those states and there are different kinds of operators hermitian unitary anti unitary anti hermitian symmetric and so on and uh, then these vectors and these states uh, can be written as elements of at this stage r uh, b and r p q and so on of course this is only true all of this is only true for quote and quote real vector spaces okay so a real vector space means that all the elements of the vector are real numbers but now we will introduce the concept of complex vector spaces so what is a complex vector space well a complex vector space is a vector space where the vectors again we'll write them in the same way now they are elements of p to the power d which is c c complex number basically d complex number okay so as an example if you have uh, your vector space c2 okay so c2 is the simplest non trivial complex vector space right and so if you have a vector which is in so i'll write this as v2 to indicate that i'm referring to uh, 
C2. So if I have a vector which is an element of C2, then that vector can be written as it is a basically two complex numbers, Z1 and Z2. Right? So from now on, we will refer to vectors as column objects. Okay. And then we have the notion of the transpose of a vector. So the transpose of a vector is written as a as a row. And if you take the transpose of a vector and multiply it by the vector, what do you get? You get You multiply this element with this element, and I presume all of you know the rules of matrix multiplication. If you don't, uh, then uh, you need to go back and open your linear algebra textbook, uh, whether from your uh, undergraduate uh, curriculum or you can go online and find many nice uh, so resources. And also, I would like to mention that so throughout. I have used lecture notes by this uh, guy called Barak Sushani, and who has uh, who's a who's a well he's a very very smart physicist. In fact, Canada is a very young guy. He's I think ten years younger than me, maybe more. <laughs> and uh, he just started his career, and uh, he has given a quantum mechanics course, and made uh, which was just given earlier this summer. And for this course, he has made a set of lecture notes, and they are available in PDF online, and they are also available on the course website. And the course website, uh, again, reminder, is it is on the NITK server, right? It is on Iris, and it runs on something on a platform called Moodle, M O O D L E, Moodle. Like Doodle or Noodle, Moodle. Okay, and uh, so these are also available on Moodle, but you can also go online and search, and you'll get his website, and there you, know, you can download them. So they are in PDF. Okay, all of these resources are available. If any of you still have any difficulty finding them, you please ask me. I will provide them for you manually. Okay, but again. My assumption is that all of you uh, know how to use the internet, and uh, uh, but but if you have any difficulties, I am there to help you. Okay, so do not hesitate to contact me in, in such a situation. So this coming back. So are we okay so far? Any questions? Okay. All right. Another thing is that. uh if you open zoom uh in zoom there is a chat option right many all of you have used that now in the chat option you have you have the possibility there is a there is a button there which says to to whom so normally you have been saying to everyone that means if i type something X Y Z, it shows up in it. It's sent to every uh, person in that meeting. But I have uh, also left open the option for you to uh, uh, send messages individually. So, for example, uh, I have just sent a message to Dhiraj, uh, and by selecting his name. or uh, you know i can select uh, shantanu's name and send him a message right so on and uh, so now you can also do that i have left open that possibility for you the reason is so that you can all if you have questions you can communicate with each other and you can also share files uh, but of course <laughs> my and the reason i have left this open is so that you can use this for educational purposes Uh, and uh, not for anything else. Okay? Uh, though I mean, uh, what you do with it is your business. 
Athira is asking, can I briefly explain what vector spaces actually mean? Yeah, yeah, Athira, I'm coming to that. Hold on. Uh, but before that, let me ask you, you have used a vector space before, right, Athira? Can you tell me if you have used a vector space before or not? Athira? Can you please unmute yourself and answer? Yes, sir. Ha. Huh. So have you used vector spaces before? Uh, yes, sir. In my BSc yes. level. You have used them. Okay. But okay. nobody explained to you what they mean, right? <laughs> okay, okay. So we'll we'll come to that, okay? So now coming back to this, uh, we'll continue with this uh, water vector spacing. And I'll take another 10 minutes. I'll give you 9 a.m. Do any of you have to leave early? Are there any other classes right now at 9 o'clock for you all? Okay, all right. So if you take the transpose of a vector multiplied by the vector, you get a single number. Okay, and this is z1 square plus z2 squared, and this is a single number. Uh, so that's an element of C. Okay, let me see if there are any questions on the Zoom chat, on the YouTube chat, no questions. Okay. All right, now, um, anything I say for the case of two-dimensional matrices or two-dimensional vector spaces will be true for uh, any arbitrary dimensionality, okay? But mostly I'll stick to the case of two, D, two dimensional two dimension for simplicity. But please keep in mind that it's true for arbitrary number of dimensions. So for example, if I take this previous observation and I say that you have a D-dimensional vector, then you have a D components here. And the transpose of this is a row vector which has a D components. And if I take the transpose and multiply it by the vector, I get V1 squared plus V2 squared plus Vd squared. But this is again an element of the complex. It is a single number, whether complex or real. Okay. Okay. Now, um, then, as I said, we have complex numbers. So we can do the, we have the operation of complex conjugation. So if I have a vector, I can write its complex conjugate. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, sorry, I made a small notation mistake. Uh, okay, so these, these, these uh, are column vectors and these are row vectors. Okay? Again, this is purely a convention, uh, but the whole world follows this convention. If you go to a distant planet, uh, you might uh, have uh, people there who treat vectors as row objects and column vectors as uh, um, well, as, as a row objects and row objects, and column objects. Of course, the, you don't even have to put them in a column, right? You 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 can you maybe there are people who work with something diagonal, like this. Who knows? Uh, but uh, all of that is fine. Point is that on our planet Earth, we use this convention. Okay, so we'll call it the human. How do you spell human? Human convention. All right, so I hope you have no disagreement with this. Now, if I take the complex conjugate, well, that means that you take the complex conjugate of each one of the elements, okay? And you, the, the same thing for uh, the complex conjugate of the transpose is you take the transpose and then you take the complex conjugate of each one of the elements. Now this, as I explained earlier, this is called, so there's a special name given to this operation, which is called V dagger. So it's actually, this symbol is called a dagger. And if you zoom into it, it looks like this. Right? And it looks, it's called a dagger because it looks like a dagger. Uh, this top part is the, handle of the dagger, this bottom part is the blade, 
<laughs> in physics, we are using daggers, and we are using annihilation and creation and then destruction. So it's actually physics is a very adventurous science. You don't have any of that in in many other uh, subjects, right? So we have V dagger, right? So now instead of taking V transpose and multiplying it by V, what happens if I take V dagger and multiply it by V? Well, I get V1, VD transpose conjugate V1, VD, right? And if I now multiply out all these elements, what do I get? Well, I have V1 conjugate times V1. So that becomes V1 absolute squared, right? And so on, right? Well, what is, what is uh, this Z? Uh, squared is equal to the real value of z whole squared plus the imaginary value of z whole squared. Now I presume that you know how to work with complex numbers. If you don't know how to work with complex numbers, then maybe you should uh, stop quantum mechanics and go back and study complex numbers. Okay. So I, you know, there's a minimum amount of background required for this course. So V1 squared plus VD squared, what are these now? These are all real numbers, right? So this will become very important uh, later on that when you take the Hermitian adjoint and multiply it by the vector, you get a real number, okay? So if I have a vector and I want to make a real number out of that vector, this is how I do that, okay? All right, so now uh, I'll take another five minutes. Uh, so Akira is asking me, what is the meaning of vector space, okay? So all of this is uh, the, uh, what happened just now? Okay, all of this, so as I explained earlier, what I, what I did so far is I've talked about briefly the history of quantum mechanics and uh, it's a brief history so i'll call it a brief history of quantum mechanics uh, <laughs> of course those of you there might be many of you who know that i'm stealing this uh, this this title uh, from a very famous book known as A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. And uh, so I'm making this joke in honor of Stephen Hawking. And more specifically, uh, in honor of uh, a very uh, famous physicist and a very great physicist, and who I had the privilege of meeting and speaking to for five or 10 minutes, one, once when I was in graduate school. And I've attended some talks were given by him. His name is Roger Penrose, and just yesterday it was announced that he is one of the Nobel Prize winners in physics uh, for this year, 2020. And this was very, very highly deserved. And uh, I think that uh, after the passing away of Stephen Hawking, uh, who deserved a Nobel Prize but was not given a Nobel Prize, uh, I think the, the Nobel Prize committee uh, felt really ashamed as they should, uh, shame on you, Nobel Prize Committee, for not giving Stephen Hawking the prize. And as you know, Nobel Prizes cannot be awarded posthumously. That means after somebody has died. Uh, that is because the founder of the Nobel Prizes, uh, Alfred Nobel, well, that's what he said in his will. Uh, so it's really stupid, I think. But uh, it sort of makes sense because if you start awarding things posthumously, well, then everybody will have a very long line of people who will have to get things fortunately, sort of like the Bharat Ratna. Bharat Ratna for you, Bharat Ratna for you, and Bharat Ratna for you, like that. So, uh, anyways, Roger Penrose got the Nobel Prize yesterday, and I'm very, very happy, and I want to say that in front of the whole world. So, congratulations, uh, uh, Roger. He's actually Sir 
because he's a he's a he's british and in britain they like to call each other my lord and my lady and all that well not really but you know sir is a title so sir roger penrose and roger penrose was the uh, collaborator and one of the graduate advisors of stephen hawking so hawking's work whatever hawking learned you can say he learned from roger penrose in a way and then stephen hawking went on to write a brief history of time which became very very famous so this is just a small historical note okay uh, so i'm still excited okay about roger penrose winning the prize oh, sorry then um, so then i've talked about the mathematical foundation in the sense of vectors then i've talked about well what can you do with these vectors and if you have a complex vector one of the things you can take is this guy now this operation has a very important name by the way this operation is called taking the inner product it's called the inner product or it's all it, it's also known as a scalar product okay scalar product because uh the result of this operation is a single number whether real or complex and single numbers are known as scalars now uh so athira asked well uh what is the meaning of uh of vectors okay now uh, let me quickly ask a question uh, can i continue for another 15 minutes if that is okay please raise your hand in the participants window in zoom okay so uh not all of you have raised your hands that means maybe some of you have to go somewhere uh or maybe you <laughs> maybe you are still figuring out where the raise hand option is okay uh, but uh, the most most of you have raised your hands uh, so i'm going to continue for another 10 15 minutes if you have to leave please remember that uh, you can uh, always uh, watch the rest of this lecture on on youtube So, what is the meaning of vectors? Okay, what 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 does it mean? Okay, so thanks, guys. Uh, Rakshit, I know you don't have anything better to do than to attend my my class. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, vectors. What 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 do they mean? Well, what they mean, you will understand only when you understand what we can. One second, please. Just give me. Somebody, somebody is asking me a, a question. Uh, so let me just respond to them. Okay, maybe maybe they're just testing out the chat. So what depends on uh, the meaning of vectors is actually depends on. what we can do with them right so what can we do with vectors okay in order to understand what they mean we have to understand what we can do with them so with vectors there are some operations one of them is called vectorization okay so if you take two vectors you can add them and the sum of these two vectors will have components okay so let me be a little bit more careful call this vector u and vector v the sum of these two will also be a vector whose components are u1 v1 right so this is element wise addition all right and of course i can also take a uh, Two trans 
the transpose of these vectors and i can add that also right and that will have elements the same elements but in the row format that's that's the only difference now can you take a vector and add it to a transpose vector no right because one is a column vector one is a row vector we don't know what to do with that we can multiply them so if you take a if you take a, a row vector let's say v transpose and multiplied by a column vector what do you get you get v1 u1 vd ud which is a uh, well a real number because uh, well it may or may not be a real number it could be a real number or complex number depending on whether these are so i will just say the scalar in general so now the thing is that real numbers are also a subset of complex numbers so i will just call it a complex number now the thing is you can take you can do the reverse operation also you can take a vector and multiply it by the transpose of another vector so instead of putting things in this order you can put them in a different order what is this quantity well this quantity let's look at it you start out with a vector which has elements u1 to ud and then you have the transpose which is v1 vd okay now when you multiply it out what do you get well if you use the rule of matrix multiplication u1 is multiplied by v1 so the rule of matrix multiplication says all the elements in a row on the left are multiplied by all the elements in the column on the right but there is only one element in this row and only one element in this column so i get a single number u1 v1 then the second element v2 again there is a single element in that row and a single element a uh, single element in this column and a single element in this row so if i multiply these two i get a second number but now i have to put that in its own slot and so in this way when i keep multiplying these numbers i get u1 times vd right so now how many are these these are d elements so i'm not writing the sum of these these, these are d separate elements then if i repeat the process with u2 again there is one row here and one column and one column so now i will get u2 v1 u2 v2 till ud vd again we get d element right so if you continue this process you can see that what you will get is u2 vd is a matrix ud sorry ah yes sorry about that my mistake yes thank you okay and what is this this is a d by d matrix okay so uh so in general a vector what is it it's it's a it's a matrix which has uh d rows and which has a single column right so if i write down the this as, as a matrix what is it it's a d by 1 matrix number of rows is d and number of columns is 1 the transpose is a 1 by d matrix okay so if i take a matrix a which has dimensions let's say uh p by q 
and if I take another matrix B, which has dimensions Q by R, okay, then I can multiply A with by with B. And to do so, this, uh, the number of columns in A must be equal to the number of rows in B. And what do I get? I get a P times R dimensional matrix. This is the general rule for, right? For matrix multiplication. Okay. So when I take the transpose of the vector and multiply it by the vector, what am I doing? I'm taking a one by D matrix and multiplying it by a D by one matrix. So what is that going to be? That's going to be a one by one matrix, which is just a scalar. So if I do the other way around, which is V multiplied by transpose of V, that's a D by one matrix multiplied by a one by D matrix. So what is this going to be? This is going to be a D by D matrix. Okay, remember what all of these things are, they will become useful uh, okay. Okay, uh, then, uh, so again, continuing with the meaning, Okay, so what do vectors mean? So vectors are useful whenever you have uh, a situation where you have, there are, there is a certain selection or number of different possibilities. Okay, possibilities or alternatives or outcomes, right? So for example, you have uh, or another way to describe it is in terms of dimension. So as an example, you could have the description of a person what is a person, right? A person is, uh, can be described in terms of certain attributes, let's say height, weight, hair color, then, well, hair or no hair, <laughs> right? I should not mention this. I'm also, you know, losing a little bit. So, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it, uh, I'll just keep it to limited to two options, okay? So if you have a person one, let's say, a person one is described by one pair of numbers. A person two is described by another pair of numbers, right? Now, you can ask, well, what is P1 plus P2? P1 plus P2 is H1 plus H2 and V1 plus P2. But now the thing is, see, this doesn't make sense in the case of person. Right? But if instead of person, I have position, So position of a particle is x1, x2, and then y1, y2. Now in this case, notice 
so the thing is that see height and weight are different types of characteristics here x1 and x2 are both the same kind of characteristics okay they both are distances so if i say x plus y it makes sense to do this this is another position vector right this doesn't make sense but this makes sense so in general the rule is that a vector consists of some set of possibilities but all of those possibilities should be of the same category okay anyways people are starting to leave the class now so i i'll stop here this is enough for one day and then we will continue tomorrow okay again tomorrow we'll also have an extended discussion if anybody cannot attend uh, if it's too too long for anybody you please uh, tell me uh, but again i have to cover a lot of material with you all okay questions uh on youtube there is only one person watching right now and that one person is me uh there are no questions on telegram there are no questions on whatsapp actually there is a second person now thank you second viewer and uh there are 24 people uh in zoom akash is asking how is a complex vector space different from a real vector space well complex vector spaces have complex numbers the like real vector spaces have real numbers that's it you have some additional operation one of the additional operations is complex conjugation complex conjugation leads to one more additional operation which is transpose complex conjugation which is called the hermitian adjoint as i explained uh, as i explained here this 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 guy the hermitian adjoint so uh, otherwise complex vector spaces are they work the same way as real vector spaces but because of this property of complex conjugation if you have a vector a complex vector then we use a different notation instead of writing v with an arrow we write it like this this is called ket ket v this is how you would pronounce it and if you take the transpose and then complex conjugate so you take v adjoint it is given a special notation which is called bra of v and uh the reason we give this a special name is because if you look at the inner product so the inner product of these two vectors now you remember this will be v1 squared amplitude squared which will be a real number and so this guy i would now write in this notation as follows the first guy is the bra vector right and the second guy is the ket vector right now these two dividing lines in the middle i can remove them and i can just write this as bracket right of course this does not have to be the same vector you can have two different vectors so i would write this as size of this is to be v i would write this as bra u times ket v and the main point is that this is an element of uh, the real number so we will see that this is one of the major differences between complex numbers and complex vector spaces and real vector spaces is that you have to treat the bra vectors and the ket vectors 
as separate uh, uh, elements. So this, the bra vector is an element of a of a vector space which we will call X, and the ket element the the ket is a element of a vector space uh, which I will call um, X bar. And X and H bar, they are identical to each other. Okay, they are the same. They are copies of each other. But in a sense, this vector is independent of this vector. Okay, this is thought of in the same way that if you have a complex number, uh, then we have we have we can write Z and Z conjugate. And we can treat these two as individual separate numbers. Right? I mean, we know that, well, they are not really separate numbers. They are actually the same number. But for example, if you have something like the function of a complex variable, then you can have a function, which is f of z, or you can have a function which is f of z and z star. And if you have studied complex analysis, you will know that this is not the same as this. And functions which are function only of z or function only of z complex conjugate are called uh, analytic, analytic functions. Right? So, uh, so you can treat these as independent objects. The same way you can treat the ket vectors and the bra vectors as independent objects. This is one of the main defining aspects of complex vector spaces. And we will talk about other as properties of complex vector spaces in the tomorrow's class. Any other questions? So if you have any further questions, please remember there is the Moodle uh, website and uh, uh, so one second, I'm, I'm, I just want to show you the uh, the page for the for this course. Okay, so I'll start my screen sharing on this computer, and I'll just show you what the Moodle page looks like. If you haven't visited the Moodle page, please go there. And as I told you, so this is what the Moodle page looks like, and you can see it here. Okay, so this is the web website called iris.nit. If you go to iris, uh, you will see the list of courses. You can click on quantum mechanics, and then you can click on the Moodle page, and then it will take you to this website. And there are two different PS703 courses. Uh, you are in the course with, with ID 27168. There is a separate course, P, copy of PH703, which is for the BTEC students. And if you have questions, you see there's a discussion forum here. So you click on this discussion forum. And you remember yesterday I showed you all that you can write questions here. So whatever questions you have, okay, they can be philosophical questions or any other kind of questions, technical questions, whatever they are, please feel free to uh, to ask uh, or write in that uh, forum, okay? And there is no question that is too small or too big. Uh, so please, uh, you know, do that, okay? All right, I'll ask again any other, any further questions now. Okay, so I, I hope that the level at which I've, I've talked about things today is, uh, has been accessible to all of you. And right now there are 25 people, uh, well, uh, 
25 of which one person is a btech so 24 approximately 24 of the msc students are attending today which i think is a pretty good number uh, the other six people i don't know whether they so i'm going to stop the zoom live stream and the uh, uh, you recording okay